Well, good day, Union Church of Manila. It is Sunday once again. Another week has passed, and we're gathered once again in this different format for such a time as this to worship and honor and give thanks to our Lord. We are evermore a church of all nations, united, centered, and maturing in Jesus Christ. We are groups of two and three gathered in living rooms and bedrooms and spaces, different spaces all across the city, all across the metropolitan area, and in different countries and around the nations, tuning in, I feel sure. We are gathered as one family in Jesus Christ. It is a communion Sunday. Today we are going to share in a time of communion. And I invite you, if, yet to have, if you've yet to have a chance, to uh, prepare bread and cup, um, that you can uh, do that now during this uh, opening portion of our service. Just uh, you feel welcome to hit pause and, and gather those elements if you like. Uh, but if, if, if you're not able to gather things now, that is okay. Certainly we will still be united in this uh, time of fellowship and communion and prayer. And uh, we will administer the sacraments after the uh, preaching of the word. And I will administer those and feel welcome at the, at the time that those are administered to again uh, pause the video and share in the communion there with the people you're with if you are participating in that way. If you're not participating in communion, I invite you still to pause and just have a time of personal prayer and reflection uh, during, that, during that segment. So let us call ourselves to worship once again. Let us lift our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us, let us now come to a time of prayer as we enter into this time of greater worship together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this new day that you have made. We thank you that your mercy and your compassion and your perspectives are new to us this day. Lord, last week you, shown, you, you gave us the perspective of the mountaintop. You brought us to that height. And we thank you and praise you for that. And this week, Lord, you're going to show us a different perspective. Perspectives from on the ground and in a time of trial. And we thank you for the perspectives you're going to give us there. Would you once more help us as a family spread out to gather together in one heart, in one mind, and to know, Lord, that we are gathered in one place in that way. We commune spiritually now. We're united, centered, and, Lord, communing in you. And would you grow from, Lord, that common heart? Would you help it to lift? And would you help it to, uh, Lord, may we just give our devotion unto you now as we sing songs of worship and praise, as we hear and participate in the, in the teaching and proclamation of the word. Attune us to, Lord, what you want to say to us as one body, as one church. Also, Lord, would you help us to be attuned to what you want us to hear as an individual in this time so come holy spirit you are with us you are great lord we honor you we love you help us to know of your great love anew this morning help us to worship you and hold nothing back today let us honor you in a way that you deserve to be honored in jesus name i pray and give thanks amen in the 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance and wisdom. We pray for the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts as we praise you through songs and hymns, as we listen to your word, and as we remember what you accomplished on the cross through your Son. We ask for your grace during this time of quarantine due to COVID-19. We pray that you'll guide our government and leaders as they make decisions. We pray for the frontliners that you'll grant them daily strength, comfort, and wisdom in supporting the fight against the virus. We know that you are in control and that you have a purpose for everything that is happening. We pray that you'll continue to teach us your ways and to trust in you. We may not understand your will, but we pray, O oh Father, for your wisdom and your grace. We pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to bless us as we meditate on your word today and throughout the week. We pray that you will call upon our hearts to follow you and to trust in you. We thank you for all you've done and all that you will do. We are thankful for technology, the daily provisions, and our salvation through Christ. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. small 
morning, UCM. Welcome to Fort Williams, where we will be studying Acts chapter 16 this morning. We are in the middle of a series called Life in Crisis and the People of God, and this morning we are looking at prison perspectives, gleaning the perspective of two individuals, Paul and Silas, in their time in prison and hopefully being able through their example to gain some strategies for us as we navigate our present crisis. And so this morning, let's uh, open up, if you have a Bible, to Acts chapter 16, and let's just go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we invite you into our time together. We invite you to speak to us and, and help us to be encouraged through your word this morning. Speak to each person around the globe that is listening to this as you uh, come into Fort Williams to help and empower me to share this message in your name. Amen. Well, I am not huge into the video game scene. Uh, but I discovered a few weeks ago that there is something called video game walkthroughs. And people get paid big money to go through or play these video games from the very beginning to the very end and post them online. In fact, there are over 12 million sites on the web where you can watch somebody play a video game. And some of these are four and five hours long to go from the very beginning of the video game to the very end of the video game. And, and you ask the question, why on earth would somebody want to uh, watch somebody else play a video game? Well, the, the whole point is, is that in, in these video games, there are all these pitfalls, there are all these uh, problems, there are all these um, dangers and, 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 and different things where you might die as you're going through the video game. And as you are watching, somebody go through and maneuver through all these and learn different strategies as to how to overcome the obstacles in the video game. It gives you the strategies to be able to implement when you go through them yourself. And as I was thinking about that this week, I, I was thinking about the scripture. In many ways, there are hundreds of stories of people who face trials and tribulations and, and different things and different types of problems in their lives. You can think of Sarah, who is barren. You think of Joseph, who is thrown in prison. David, who is wandering through the wilderness trying to run away from Saul. Jonah in the belly of a great fish. You, you have Paul in prison and all these different scenarios that are playing out throughout Scripture. And I think that the Scripture gives us so many of these different scenarios so that we could be able to walk through our crises and our problems that we face in our lives while gaining the, the, the ideas and the strategies from other people in Scripture. In fact, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in a very negative way. The people of Israel were doing some uh, bad things in the wilderness. And, and Paul says this. He says, now these things took place as an example for us. These things and this, this, this example from the people of Israel is a walkthrough for you to avoid the pitfalls that they fell into. But I think that there are other things in scriptures which help us to gain insight as to how to overcome many of the pitfalls that we might face in the crises that we engage in in our lives. And this brings us to the book of Acts in chapter 16, where we are going to get what I am calling the prison perspective, where Paul and Silas are going to provide a walkthrough and how to walk through difficult days. Now, if you look at the scripture, I want you to drop your eyes down to verse 6. Notice what the scripture tells us. It says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Now, as you look at all of these names here in the 21st century living in, in this part of the world in Asia, maybe these names don't mean a whole lot to you. But I want to show you on the map what had happened. They are ministering into these areas of Galatia and, and Phrygia, and they're, they're trying to build the church. And, and they want to go up into Bithynia, and so they head over to Mysia, and they, they, they want to head this way. But it says that they were forbidden to go up there, that there is a dead end that stops them, and they are unable to carry out the mission that they want to go and, and, and execute at this time. 
dead end. Stop. The ministry is going well and in all these different areas. And they say, let's just go up here and continue this work. And all of a sudden, dead end. Can't go there. And as I was thinking about that this week, I, I think that uh, when we are in this present crisis, I have heard a lot of people talking about being stymied or being in a dead end. Dead end with businesses, dead end with jobs, dead end projects that we were going to begin. See, the crisis has created so many different dead ends where people are saying, well, I was going to do this. I had plans for this, but then coronavirus came. Even me, myself as pastor, uh, you know, my first year at UCM. I was talking with Pastor Noah several times saying, man, the first year I had this plan, I had this plan, I had this plan, I had this plan. Dead end. Unable to do it. Un unable to carry it out. And, and, and it can, can, can become quite frustrating. But I want you to understand that this is not a dead end. Although they might have thought it as a dead end. And although they might have been frustrated that they couldn't carry out their plan. But this was not a dead end for Paul and Silas. This is going to be what we call a reroute. In fact, look at verses 9 and 10. It says, And then a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Notice, the dead end was actually God redirecting and creating a detour. If you look on the map, this is they're trying to go up this way. They want to take the gospel into all these different areas. But God actually had a bigger plan to go to an area that was less reached than Asia Minor. Happening, moving all the way over to Macedonia, which is the modern Greece area. And God says, gives them this vision, come and help us over here. And so this is exactly what Paul and Silas do. It wasn't a dead end at all, but a new calling, a new venture. And they go to Asia Minor and they meet this woman named Lydia. And, and Lydia is the seller of purple goods. That just means a high retail, uh, uh, fine clothing, you know, uh, the seller of Prada or the seller of Gucci. Uh, she, she's, she sells uh, uh, fine products. Uh, it was, the purples was the most expensive kind of clothing in the day. And, and Paul and Silas, they minister to her in Macedonia. And in this area, she becomes, according to what we understand about from Scripture, the first woman who is, becomes a follower of Jesus in Asia Minor, or in Macedonia, I'm sorry. See, God takes this opportunity, this dead end, uses it as a detour, and begins to win new people to Christ. See, I put number one on your outline. If you're following along, jot this down this morning. In moments of crisis, I need to remember I am not at a dead end, but at a detour. That God can still use the moments of crisis, even though I see dead end, God can use that for a detour. Detour to redirect, refocus, rebuild our lives. Listen, I have received over the last three or four weeks, over the time of this crisis, so many different emails from people saying to me, Pastor, you know, this has been very hard on me. But during this time, the Lord has been teaching me this. The Lord has been giving me this. The Lord has moved me into this. The Lord has compelled me to this. This is what God is doing in my life. They have seen this not as a dead end, but as an opportunity that God has put in their life to redirect and refocus. Now, we can come to this situation completely frustrated that God is closing all the doors in front of us and placing dead ends all around us, or we can come to it asking Him to show us what He wants us to learn or what He wants us to do or how He wants to redirect or detour our life to the place that He wants us to be in order to advance his kingdom and to uh, use us the way he wants us to be used. 
This is not a dead end. This is a detour. But I want you to notice also next here that Paul and Silas are given this detour, but they maintain the same mission. Drop your eyes down to verse 13. It says, And on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. This is where he's going to meet Lydia. And it says, We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her whole house as well, she urged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. Notice what happens here. I want to look not from uh, 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 Lydia's perspective, but I want you to see what Paul and Silas do in their detour. In the midst of their detour, God says to them, we want you to go into a new area. We want you to take on a new mission, but uh, a, a new strategy. But I want you to understand that their fundamental message and their fundamental mission remains the same. Yeah, it's a new forum. They're not used to sharing with women in these areas. They go to a new area, a new strategy. But they are committed to the same purpose that God has called them to in the first place. See, even in your detours, you need to understand that your central mission remains the same. Your purpose in life is still to glorify God. It is still to serve His people, to love His people, and advance His kingdom. And it is entirely possible that, in fact, yes, your circumstances have changed in such a way that you have to do this differently. And your method may have changed because of quarantine. But listen, your mission still remains the same. As a, as a church, our strategy is quite different now. When we think of our church, we, we are unable to meet in our great facility. In fact, it has been sitting virtually empty this whole time. There's just a, a, a few people in that massive building this whole time. And, and, and I think, boy, it would be nice to go and see everyone and, and uh, interact with everyone. And that was the catalyst that God was using to reach many people through that building. But that does not mean that because that has closed or that because we are in this detour, that the church stops being the church, that our mission has somehow changed. No, the mission still remains the same for all of us to glorify God and to love and reach his people and to advance his kingdom. And I don't know how long that building will remain empty. I don't know how long this crisis will be this way. But let me tell you, beloved, that your mission is still the same. And I wonder if you are committed to that mission or if you're just trying to sort of ride out your time. Are you thinking about how you can carry out the mission of God for your life during this time? I think of the new approaches that have come from UCM. We have scores of online ministry now. We have new ways of providing resources to the, uh, the community. I love hearing some of the effective strategy that people in our church are coming up with. Well, they're reading scripture with other people online, one-on-one. -on -one. They're, they're making medical masks. They're writing new articles or books. They're producing new music. They're, they're doing all sorts of new things to advance the kingdom of God. Their strategy or their tactics have changed in their redirection, but their purpose remains the same, and they are trying to figure out how to execute their purpose in a new strategy. I am wondering if that's what you are trying to do in your life right now. I think of back in the late, uh, early 90s, Pepsi began to... Uh, they, they did something that rocked the world, I guess. They changed their can, their logo, from the old to the new. And this caused such an uproar. People were upset. It wasn't even like Coke that changed the, the, the content or changed the formula. The, the, the Pepsi was the same product inside. They just changed the outside. And people went crazy. You can't do this. You know, Even their sales dropped because they changed the outside. 
I, I think that is uh, what people are worried about today. Oh, it's so bad that our strategies have changed. This whole thing has changed. But listen, it's still the same thing. We are still the same church. You are still the same child of God. You are still the same one who is following the plan of God for your life. Yeah, the circumstances have changed. The strategies have changed. The methods have changed. The can has changed. But it is the same on the inside. Second thing this morning, jot this down. In crisis, I need to remember, I need to maintain my mission. God has not changed my basic purpose. And so I need to maintain my mission. So after the reroute and the change of plans, and after sharing with Lydia and, and, and her entire family is baptized, and, and, and great things are happening in, uh, in Macedonia, you know, Paul and Silas start this wonderful ministry, right, where thousands of people come to Christ, where the church is expanding rapidly, where amazing things are unfolding, and people are being healed left and right, and it is the best season of ministry they've ever experienced, Right? Wrong. This reroute actually brings them into even a more difficult time in their lives. It, and it actually leads them to a, a prison. Notice what the Bible says. They're, they're, they're going to face all kinds of obstacles and problems. Notice what it says. Look down at verse 16 through 24. It says this, As we were going out to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But here's where it gets difficult for Paul and Silas. It says, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing the city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into a prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Uh, 24. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Notice, what does the scripture say? After all of this happens and, and their ministry starts off on this great new you know, conversion of Lydia and her family, there's high hopes. And shortly after that, what happens? The bottom falls out. It says that, first of all, the people come to them and say, Oh, these Jews, their customs are not lawful for us. There's some racism going on. And then what does it say? It says that the crowds joined in attacking them, and they began to be beaten with rods. These beatings sometimes would kill the people. At least they would uh, create these bruises or broken ribs or open sores on them. A very painful process. And after that, it says that they are thrown into prison. And, and the jailer, he's not satisfied for them to be just in the regular prison area. That they, they is thrown into the inner part of the prison. And, uh, prisons at that time, there were three different parts. There was the sort of the barracks part that was... It was uh, very loose, and people were even almost free to come and go uh, in and out to, in, in, to a certain area. And then there was a, a, a second layer where people would be locked up inside this area. They were for moderate criminals, but then the worst criminals would be brought into the inner area or the inner part of the prison. And, and, and according to archaeologists, here's a picture of one of those uh, in Rome. I've been to this one. And, and, and what they would do is drop them down into this hole, and it would be dark, and it would be dank, and there was no light in this whatsoever. And according to archaeologists, a lot of the, 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 the um, waste 
would run off from the rest of the prison and flow down into this area, the inner part of the prison. And so you could think about that area, how dark and how cold and how wet and how stinky it was. And there's Paul and Silas, and they're suffering there. They're going through this difficult moment. And they've got to be thinking, you know, this redirect, Lord. We were doing so well in, in Asia Minor, and now we're down here and, and we're being taken into this prison and, and things are rough, Lord. We, we don't want to be here. See, a lot of times we like to think that the Lord redirects us to, quote, better places or, or more enjoyable places. How many times have you heard somebody say, I'm so thankful that the Lord, I was going down this path and he took me out of this path and brought me down this better path. But sometimes the better path that God has for us is the path of crisis, is the path that he has to build something in our lives that we aren't aware of. And so sometimes the redirect that we have, that God leads us to, is a challenge. But I want you to notice how Paul and Silas deal with this challenge. Notice what the text says down in verse 25. It says that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Notice, what, what, is, what does it say? It says that, first of all, it is midnight. It is in the middle of the night. Now, I've heard some pastors or different Bible studies or books or commentators say, well, this shows just how committed Paul and Silas were, that they were praying all night through all of the watches of the night. And, and, and that could very well be the case. But I know this, that oftentimes I am up at midnight for different reasons. When I am in the middle of crisis, I am up at midnight because my mind won't shut off and I don't have peace in my heart. And it seems to be that that is that in that darkness and the quietness of midnight that my anxieties begin to rise uh, to greater levels. And, and maybe that's where you are even right now. It's at night when everything is still that you can't sleep because your mind is just going worried about the situation that you are facing in your present life. And that might be the case with Paul and Silas. But what do they do at midnight? Instead of just pacing the floor in worry, what do they do? It says that they go to the Lord in prayer and they go to Him in worship. And this helps them get the proper perspective in a seemingly hopeless situation. I was trying to picture them here this week. Trying to picture their situation and the, the, the struggle that they were going through and, and the difficulties that they were facing at that time. And, and I could almost see them there, you know, just deflated. Coming off of, coming from Asia Minor and coming into this new area, this new ministry, these high hopes that they had for ministry. And here they are thinking, what has happened to us? Lord, you gave us this vision to come to Macedonia. We thought we would be doing great things, not sitting in a Roman prison, not sitting in a dark, stinky place with, with, with wounds and, and bruises and, and, and pain in our body. I'm sure they're struggling mentally. I can see Silas looking over to Paul. Paul. How are you feeling, man? Oh, Paul says, oh boy, man, my back is killing me. That, the, the final beatings that they gave me, the, those are really hurting. How about you, Silas? Yeah, yeah my mouth, man, they, they broke my tooth. I think, you know, I, I just can't stop this pain in here. And, and, and then they're just deflated and talking about maybe the pain that they're going through and, and wondering with, with each other, what's happened here? What, what, what is the Lord doing? And Paul says to Silas, Silas, let's, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. I don't know what else to do at this point. And then Silas says, okay. And, and they start praying, Lord, you brought us here. You called us here. You have a purpose for us here, Lord. We don't know why we're going through this. We don't know why we're in this agony and why we have to go through this suffering and why you've placed us in this inner cell, in this dark, stinky spot. But Lord... We, we look to you, and all of a sudden, you know, there's silence, and he sing, starts singing, you know, Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. With patience bear thy cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. 
In every change, he faithful will remain. And then Paul, after hearing that, you know, is encouraged. And he starts singing, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, how great thou art. And they begin to sing, and the Bible says that they're not just singing under their breath, that somehow in all of this, the, the momentum is carrying, and it says that the prisoners are hearing them, that this noise coming out of the inner prison cell, the inner part, and all the different people in the, in the prison are hearing them sing. It's this loud voice of praise. And not being particularly quiet, I, I don't know if they were very good singers, but apparently everyone is listening. You see, I believe it's in these moments of crisis that Paul and Silas give us the strategy, and the strategy is this. We need to refocus on Christ. How did they do that? They go in prayer and they go in worship. All of their gaze and all of their attention is focused on Christ. I don't know if you've ever seen these stereograms. I love these things. I, I, I love looking at them and I'm, I'm sure some of you are probably tuning out to me right now and just looking at the stereogram trying to see the picture in it. But in a stereogram, it looks like it's just a picture of chaos, that there's nothing there. But if you stare at it for a long time and sort of refocus in there, you can see a picture comes, a 3D picture comes out. This particular one is a, a bunny rabbit, and I'm sure many of you now are pausing the, the, the video and looking in and trying to find the little bunny rabbit in the middle of the stereogram. But I think that's what we do when we worship, when we focus in on Christ, when we sort of in the chaos of our situation just glare into him and try to find him and through prayer, through worship, through gazing into a faithful stare into him. And as we do that, that redirects, that re-encourages, that gives us hope, that begins to change our whole outlook in, in our current situation. Remember that old song, turn your eyes on Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That, that's what we need to do in the midst of our crisis. When, when the things of earth are, are, are dark and, and, and dreary, we need to focus on him and his glory and grace, and, and it changes our perspective. I think that's what the scripture teaches us in a very well-known text. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, many of you can quote it. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. And sometimes we, we use this verse when we're trying to make a decision or when we're trying to uh, have this sort of life-changing path that we go down in our lives. But oftentimes we forget this verse in our moments of crisis and I think this is an incredibly important verse for us in our moments of crisis because it says when we are in these places where we don't understand it says in all your ways underline it acknowledge him and that doesn't just mean sort of look to God and say hey Lord uh, I'm looking to you uh, uh, tell me what I need to do that, that's part of it but this word acknowledge comes from the Greek or the Hebrew root word of yada and yada, this word yada in the original language means to sort of throw or to throw an extended hand and to worship with an extended hand. And so this idea where we are going to the Lord in the midst of our problems and, 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 and we don't know what to do, but in all our ways we throw up our hands in extension to God saying, I come to you completely lost in my situation, but I throw my hands up to you in worship. I believe that that is exactly what Paul and Silas are doing here at midnight. They are in a pit in the inner cell, and they're saying, Lord, you brought us here. They're worried. They're concerned. It's midnight. Their minds are troubled. So what do they do? They throw out their hands in worship. They acknowledge him to get a sense of the right path that God has for them. Direct the path, though, does not mean when it says that he will direct your path, it doesn't just mean he's going to show you the way out. 
Sometimes it means that he's going to show us what we need to learn in our crisis. Sometimes it means he's going to show us how to be still. Sometimes he's going to show us how to increase our trust in him. But let me ask you, in this time, have you been throwing out your hands in worship during this present crisis? Or are you just letting your midnight hour consume you? Now is the time to acknowledge him. And throw out your hands in all your ways, continually throwing out your hands. How often are you doing that to him during this time? Last thing on your outline, jot it down this morning. In crisis moments, I need to make sure that I am regularly worshiping with extended hands. I need to make sure that I am regularly worshiping with extended hands. I, uh, there was a former student of mine. He is... Um, He's from Pakistan, and uh, we were talking about life in Pakistan and being a Christian in Pakistan. And as much of the church is being persecuted in that part of the world, and and, and he was talking about this persecution. And I said, you know, how is it that the church in Pakistan is dealing with this? Or, you know, are they? How, how should we be praying for you? And he said, don't pray that. God would take us out of the situation. Instead, he said, pray that we wouldn't lose sight of him in the midst of the situation and we would be able to endure the situation, that we would be found faithful and have the courage for his calling for us. I thought, you know, that that's an interesting answer. Most of us softies like me would say, Lord, just get me to the end. Help me to get out of this situation take me to safety but his perspective was different he was saying i don't pray that at all i pray that i could just focus on him and as i focus on him he will give me what i need to get through the current situation it takes us to another prison scene of the apostle paul in philippians in the book of philippians paul finds himself in another prison Paul was regularly a visitor of prisons. And so he finds himself in a Roman prison and he shares more of his prison perspective. He says to the church of Philippi, he says, and I have learned, notice he says it's a learning process. So that learning process may have started all the way back in Macedonia when he's in a prison with Silas. But he says, uh, by the time he gets to Rome, he says, I've learned something. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound in every, any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And what's the secret? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What is he saying here? It doesn't matter what my circumstance is because I have learned that if Christ is with me in those circumstances, I have learned all the way back in Macedonia, if I worship the Lord, if I seek the Lord, if I pray to the Lord, he gives me what I need in whatever circumstance that I am in. And so I now have learned that contentment that even in crisis, when I am in crisis, I just throw my hands in worship to the Lord. And that is where I find my contentment. That is what my friend from Pakistan was saying. Saying, I don't want to be out of the situation. That's not what we're praying for. We're praying that we would be able to keep our gaze on Christ. Because it's through that gaze that he will bring us through our present crisis. And so in all of my ways, I need to be able to acknowledge him and throw my hands up to God. The persecution is fine. Why? I've thrown my hands up to the Lord. I'm content. When, when things are going well, in all of my ways, in all of my ways, things are going well. I, I throw my hands up to the Lord and, and things are fine. When I'm in the middle of uh, hunger, it's okay. I've thrown my hands up to Christ and I still am content because he is with me. I, I am in my COVID virus. I throw my hands to Christ. He is, me. Uh, he, he is with me. Uh, I, in my business that I see is kind of failing right now, I throw my hands to the Lord and I find my contentment. Listen, beloved. That is what we need to do. We need to acknowledge him in all of our ways, all of our days, 
good and bad and find our contentment in the Lord. And He will direct our paths and give us what we need in the moment of crisis. See, Paul's prison perspective and Silas's prison perspective, it's a walkthrough for you and I. And I think it's a very relevant walkthrough through what we're going through in our present days. And Paul is showing us how to approach the most desperate and difficult days in our life. And we need to, in this moment, what we've learned, we need to allow for these detours. We, but we need to maintain our mission and we need to constantly be worshiping and throwing our hands back to the Lord. And I hope as we have gone through this walk through together of Scripture from Paul and Silas that you have been able to gain some strategies as to how to face the current crisis that this whole world is pre uh, presently facing. And I hope that you have been able to be encouraged in the word of the Lord this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the example of the forefathers who have gone before us and shown us how to deal with difficult moments in our life, God. I pray for the members of UCM, Lord, as I know that we have been now in, in these circumstances for a very long time, and we don't know when we're getting out of them, and we don't know what we're going to face as we get out of them, Lord. But I pray that you would use this time for each of us. That it would be a time, a detour that encourages us, that does something in each of our lives, that we would remember the purpose that you have for our lives, and we would remember that when we begin to feel the anxiety, to acknowledge you in all of our ways, to be redirected and to be content in our circumstances. Lord, I pray for our members this morning. Give them the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we ask this in your name. Amen. God bless. People from north and south and east and west will gather at table in the kingdom of God. The Lord invites us now to gather with him and with one another to share in this special meal that he has prepared. So let us now give thanks. Let us pray. Lord, we come with receptive hearts now. Help us to imagine that we are gathered at the common table in the kingdom of God around your table. Help us to imagine that we are all there, Lord, invited guests of yours to share in a celebration. And Lord, to do that with you and with one another. Lord, would you continue to draw especially close to us in this time? Help us to receive from you. Help us to know of your great love for us in this time. We pray that you would help us to reconnect with what it is to truly live, what it is to be saved by your amazing love and life. Reconnect us, Lord, in your joy. Reconnect us in your graciousness. Help us to know, Lord, that you are with us and that Lord we are a family Lord united by great love and great joy be with us evermore in this time I pray in Jesus name Amen so the Lord was gathered with his disciples at that meal at that Passover meal around that table and he first from the table picked up the bread and he gave thanks to God the Father for it. And then he broke it. And he offered it to each one of them there. He said, this is my body, 
It's broken for you. Take it and eat it. And when you do, remember me. In the same way from the table, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take from it, drink from it, and when you do, remember me. Friends, whenever we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, in a way we proclaim God's great love for us, that he would give of himself fully, body and blood, sacrificially, so that we may know without a doubt his great love for us and that it would give witness to the world around us that we too believe in his great love in his redeeming act that he gave his life so that we may really live really live and really have a true life and have it in abundance these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Lord, we thank you for communing with us. We thank you for the chance to commune with you and with one another. We thank you for your perspectives that you've given us throughout this time of worship. And uh, Lord, taking in your word and communing with you and with one another, following your word. Lord, um, we love you and we thank you for loving us. Continue, would you, to help us to know of your great love, your great joy as we... Lord, are a family, a people following you. And Lord, there is great strength. There is great hope. There is great joy in that. Thank you for that felt reminder. Would you empower us and be at our backs as we go forth now as one family of faith in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week ahead, Union Church.
Greetings to all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am Zaida. I serve through the children's ministry. Thank you for worshiping with us today. This gift of time in this extended quarantine provides us more opportunities to study and reflect on the scripture. To help us in studying the Word of God, a Bible reading plan is available for you. You may download this from the UCM website. For further spiritual nourishment, let's continue to follow the weekly scriptural reflections, Essentials for Quarantine. UCM is mindful of the enormous challenges this crisis is bringing to many. The UCM crisis team is working on various ways our church could serve our community during this time of quarantine. Beyond sending nutritious meals to health workers in public hospitals, our church is in partnership with the Center for Community Transformation to distribute food for disadvantaged youth and children in Metro Manila during this COVID-19 crisis. We have also been reaching out to many of you, love knowing how you are doing, and blessed to get the opportunity of being able to pray for you. If we haven't connected to you, it could mean that we were not able to receive your updated phone number or email address. Please do email us your contact information at ucmcares at unionchurch.ph. You may also like to give to help us support our brothers and sisters in need, especially in this challenging time. Should you also want to make an offering or continue with your pledge, online giving is available. UCM has also added more ways on how to give while you are at home. Please visit the website for more information. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Please do join us for worship. We look forward to a day of joy and celebration. While we are still in quarantine, let us grow stronger in our faith and continue with our prayers for God's healing and mercy. Stay well, UCM family. Let's stay stronger together in God's grace.